Savior to join us for this wonderful program on fan books and the importance of the freedom to read. And here I have the lovely and wonderful Sheila Vinan from Montana State University. We're thrilled because this is one of several programs that the Bozeman Public Library is able to co-sponsor to do together with the wonderful library and faculty from Montana State University Library. And so we're thrilled that everybody is here and we're thrilled that we're able to have this partnership. Um, I'll introduce the committee. Who is on the committee for this evening that is brave enough to stand up? Jane, you want to stand up? Is Carmen in here? I think she stepped out for second. Well, actually, we have more than one person on the committee. She <laughs> makes two. And Layla. Layla. And Angela. Angela. And Michelle. And Michelle. And Rita is helping a customer. She got pulled. Rita from the high school and Carmen will be here shortly. And Ariana is here from the Country Bookshelf, and we are also co-sponsoring with the Country Bookshelf. Thank you very much for your ongoing support of our programs, Ariana. Appreciate it. <laughs> Here's the wonderful Carmen. If you did not see her at 5.30 on the news, you can catch her at 10 o'clock. <laughs> if you see her class, she gave a great millennium. Um, one thing before Sheila does an introduction for us. I do want to point out that in your chair, you should have an evaluation form. And if you would be kind enough to fill that out and give it to us this evening or you leave before you leave, that will help us with next year's program. Yes, thank you all for coming. We're really excited to see you here and see such a nice turnout. You just never know when you're planning these events what you're competing with on a particular night. And that's what's always wonderful when you come in and the room is full. So thanks a lot for coming. So, before we get started, we have a wonderful lineup of readers for you tonight about what are we doing here tonight? What are we celebrating tonight? Um, today is the second day of a week-long celebration called Van Books Week. And it was an, it's an annual event, it happens every fall, usually around this time of year. And it was started in 1982, so it's had a long, long life. Started by the American Library Association and its office for intellectual freedom, and is also sponsored by the Association of American Booksellers, the National Council of Teachers of English, and some other like-minded organizations. So it's, it's, it's a big collaboration. And this event is basically to celebrate our freedom to read, and in support of the freedom to seek and express ideas, even those that, that some consider unorthodox or unpopular. These are guaranteed to us by our First Amendment. Now, unfortunately, ever since books came out, they've been challenged or banned. I mean, you go back to Greek history and there were people saying, oh, Aristotle, we don't want that stuff. It's just dangerous. Um, and challenges and occasional banning still occur in this country and even close to home. Um, I don't know how many of you know that just last spring, this spring, in uh, Livingston, the young adult novel, Pancilla by Adam Rapp, was the subject of a challenge at the Park County High School. And the absolutely true diary of a part-time Indian by Sherman Alexi was challenged at the building school in season before. Um, happily, both districts had great policies in place for dealing with challenges. They went through those policies, followed the process, and <coughs> neither challenge succeeded, but we, they just don't go away. They keep coming up with challenges. And very often, families succeed. There was just a recent one in the East Wake High School in North Carolina, which banned Tony Morrison's Bluest Eye from its curriculum. Very, very sad to say. So they, sometimes the challenges do succeed. So Ban Books Weeks tries to focus efforts across the country about these challenges, banning just to, to keep awareness up that these things do happen and uh, draw attention to the harms of censorship. Happily, though these challenges continue and occasionally bannings do take place, I think a lot of the celebration is in part because most of the time those challenges do not succeed and the folks and those materials remain where they should be in classrooms and in libraries. And this only happens to the efforts of fabulous librarians, teachers, we have teachers in the room, students, community members who will stand up and speak out for this freedom to read and support that. 
And this year is a little interesting because Van Buckley has never had an additional theme. This year, um, they decided to focus attention on graphic novels and comics, which are uh, graphic novels. Comics have been around for a long time. They've been challenged since day one, too, as, as I'm fit for, for children. <laughs> um, and graphic novels, which is a newer form of that, um, have, those books have been making the top ten down lists for quite a while now, so a lot of attention being paid to those. So we have, uh, for tonight's celebration, we've got invited some local authors. We're really excited to have local authors here to, to work with us, educators and librarians, and they're all going to share a short passage from a favorite book that's been the subject of a challenge in school or library. And we are featuring, the, and this is the first time we've ever done it, so I bet it's going to work really great because of Layla's fabulous work. We're going to actually show the, the graphics that go along with those readings for those, those particular selections. So we're excited about that. So I hope you enjoy the evening, and I'm going to turn it over to Susan, who will introduce our readers. Thanks. Our first uh, reader this evening is Mr. Kent Davis. Kent is going to be reading from Sandman by Neil Gaiman. Steps in the sand, and there are two sets of footsteps together because of some of them are gods, except there aren't always two of them. And the woman says to God, Where were you when I was in trouble? And he says that I, it was me carrying you. You told me. It's a very pretty story. Whatever, Rosie, these days I just feel like God's dumped me down in the sand. Do you? believe in God? I believe in lots of things. Chantal did b believe in God. She loved spiders and skulls and graveyards for themselves. I love them because they showed transience. You're smiling. What, what are you smiling at? I don't know, because you never used to speak, I suppose. Chantal did all the speaking for both of you. Because I was and I'm sitting there not saying stammer because the last time I finished one of her sentences she started to cry and would talk again for an hour. This is stuttered. I thought skulls were a way of touching forever. Can you see my skull yet? They're getting pretty skinny, Zelda, but not yet. And there's just so many things inside of that little short passage. And, and 
Sandman is about so many, it's, it's about these huge, huge issues and these small, small issues, but the two things, the reason why I chose this particular passage, one is that it, it questions the status quo, right? It questions school. Um, for kids, that's a big deal. And it also questions belief. And for people, that's a big deal. But, but I think the thing that's important to remember is that questioning isn't necessarily defiance.
She said it could be bought at the filling station and that her family had one in every room. The no pest strip, she explained, released a poison that killed all the flies. What do your lizards eat, I asked. <laughs> we don't have any lizards either, she said. I went home and I told mom we needed to get a no pest strip like Carla's family, but she refused. If it kills the flies, she said, it can't be very good for us. So that's just a short passage from this book, really worth reading if you guys haven't. Um, it's just filled with rich, rich narrative and fabric from family. Thank you. Roy and Sado's nest, 
and the book says Roy and Silo knew just what to do. They took turns sitting on the egg day and night. They, one would leave and go get food and come back and the other, etc. They sat on it for over a month, just like all the other penguins were doing, until crack, out came the little baby chick whom the zookeeper named Tango, because it takes two to tango. And then after that, in a, a delightful way, the daddies teach Tango everything she needs to know. They feed her from their beaks. They teach her how to sing for her food. They snuggle with her in their nest. And the day that they debut and bring her out into the zoo pool for the first time, all of the patrons of the zoo, the people who've been coming and watching and waiting to see this baby, all applaud. And um, it ends at night, the three penguins return to their nest. There they snuggled together with <coughs> all of the other penguins in the penguin house, and all the other animals in the zoo, and all the families in the big city around them. They went to sleep. This, um, the thing that's interesting about this book is that it's based on a true story. It's based on the story of follows six years in the life of two chinstrap penguins who lived in Central Park Zoo. Um, and they were given this egg to raise. And, um, and this is the story. So this book was challenged for homosexuality. The line that prompted the challenge of this book was, Tango was the first penguin in the zoo to have two daddies. I have to say the reason I chose this book is, I remember when it came into the library actually in 2005. To me, it is just a touching and joyful story about love and devotion of parents for their child. And it just comes across this way. It's really about the meaning of family. If this book introduces a child to same-sex parents, I think it's a tender and wonderful way to do it. And I think that really what matters to the young child, a young child, reading this book, is how the love comes across. It's just very heartwarming how these daddies take care of their, their child. In addition, uh, one reason why I chose this book is I'm just enchanted because art in this book. It, it, it's Henry Cole at his best. It, the faces and the bodies of the penguins, if you study the illustrations as children do, are incredibly expressive. The pictures really can tell the story without words. You could get the gist of the story if the words weren't there. He did such a beautiful job. I think for children of same-sex parents, I can imagine the story being of providing some scaffolding for future interactions about their family. And for any child, this book invites discussion of different kinds of families. And children today in our, in our world are familiar with this diversity if they attend school or engage in society all uh, around them. So I hope you'll read this book, and Tango Makes Three, and see what you think. Sometime around 1976, I was used as a test case for the Teton County School Board. My mother, who worked for the school at the time, had been approached by a member of the school board who'd heard through the grapevine that her son was a bit of a reader. Maybe young Mr. Abrams could take a look at a book that had come to their attention recently and tell the school board if it was suitable for young audiences in Jackson, Wyoming. This person who cut a deal with my mother was probably a decent guy overall, but when it came to ultra-conservatism, he was the champ. <laughs> Names aren't important, it's all water under the bridge by this point, uh, but for the sake of identification, let's just say his first name was Ass, last name Pucker. Anyway, word had reached my mother that Mr. Pucker was looking for a kid to read a book that, according to certain members of the school board, might not be suitable for the curriculum. A book which might be too rough for young, delicate eyes. And so my mother approached me with a proposition. Rhea, read this and tell me if it's okay to be taught in your English class. Imagine that. Me, the perpetually skinny, stuttering, anxiety-ridden, least popular boy in Jackson Hole Junior High was being asked to render an opinion which could potentially have cataclysmic, life-altering impacts. 
I said, okay. So my mother reached into a brown paper sack. She looked around to make sure that we were alone. And then she handed me the book, The Chocolate War by Robert Cormier. I turned to the first page and I started reading. They murdered him. Well, okay, that was a pretty good beginning. So I went on. As he turned to take the ball, a dam burst against the side of his head and a hand grenade shattered his stomach. Engulfed by nausea, he pitched toward the grass. His mouth encountered gravel and he spat frantically, afraid that some of his teeth had been knocked out. Okay, not bad, not bad at all. As it turns out, the chocolate war was not only not bad, it was damn good. That guy getting figuratively murdered on the football field, by the way, in the opening paragraphs was Jerry Renault. He's a freshman at an all-boys Catholic prep school who does one very important thing during a school fundraiser. He says no. Despite the no, he's not going to sell chocolates. Despite the peer pressure and taunts from a particularly unpleasant teacher named Brother Leon, and bullying at the hands of a secret society of upperclassmen called the Vigils, Jerry Renault stands firm in his refusal to sell boxes of chocolate to raise money for his school. It's a novel about the solitary David facing down the evil corporate Goliath. What's not to love? I mean, why the concern? Why the rush to ban this smart, provocative book? Uh, I got my answer on page 17. <laughs> why did he always feel so guilty whenever he looked at Playboy and the other magazines? A lot of guys, a lot of guys bought them passed them around at school, hid them in the covers of notebooks, even resold them. Ah, there's the rub, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm so flustered, I turned the page. Okay. Here we go. So anyways, and the book goes on, or that passage goes on, I'm um, skipping ahead a little bit. And this is talking about Jerry. A longing filled him. Would a girl ever love him? The one devastating sorrow he carried within him was the fear that he would die before holding a girl's breast in his hand. So, in all fairness, I could see the reason for Mr. Pucker's sweaty palm worry. But in all honesty, this, the Teton County School Board's efforts to ban teenage boys from thinking of such matters was about as effective as telling the wind to stop blowing. <laughs> what teenage boy didn't hide a playboy under his mattress or today find ways to uh, fix